Good morning and welcome to KAUST Live. I'm Nicholas DeMille. Uh, at KAUST we get to share space with some pretty remarkable people. Uh, people who change the way that we see things and sometimes even the way that we see ourselves. Uh, our guest today is Pierre Magistretti and he certainly falls into that category. Thank you for joining us Dr. Magistretti. My pleasure. Um, so I, I wanted to start off with what might appear a silly question. Um, but why brain research? Why has that become uh, your thing? Well, it started from an unexpected uh, angle, I would say. Um, um, I lived uh, in various places in Europe, mainly in Switzerland and Italy. And when I was uh, in high school, it, I happened to be in Rome. <laughs> and uh, I was exposed to a lot of uh, classical uh, studies, Latin, Greek, philosophy, mm -hmm. and that made me become interested in the in the human mind, mm -hmm. uh, producing such beautiful uh, poems already 3,000 years ago with the uh, ancient Greeks and then uh, f uh, other um, production of what I thought was uh, obviously the human mind. and. Mm -hmm. Uh, I guess because n despite this interest in humanities, mm. um, I, I was uh, I loved science. I said, well, uh, the human mind is the product of the brain, so I have to study the brain. Mm -hmm. So quite, as I said, unexpectedly uh, or maybe unconventionally, I, I entered brain research not through science but through my interest for the human mind. Yeah. And, and so you've had uh, over three decades of, of research uh, in particular. So talk in a high level about what that research is. So it uh, started uh, at the end of my medical studies yeah. uh, at the University of Geneva. Um, I was somehow, um, I realized that my background was too weak uh, in, in medicine at the time. We studied many organs, but the brain, you know, that was, as I said, 30, 35 years ago. Mm -hmm. and, and so there was still, um, was not part as much as now uh, of the medical curriculum. Neuroscience was uh, really not even existing, uh, particularly in Europe. It was mm -hmm. just an emerging discipline mm -hmm. from different uh, other disciplines. And so um, I, I thought, well, I, I have to, if I want to do what I want, I study the brain, I have to go a bit further. So um, I enrolled in a graduate program at the uh, University of California, San Diego, uh, and uh, working at the Salk Institute with uh, one of the really prime neuroscientists at the time, uh, Dr. Floyd Bloom. And uh, I s he put me on a project uh, that, uh, uh, without going into many details, had nothing to do uh, with uh, with what I eventually ended up studying for 30 years. Uh, it was uh, an assay uh, to study the action of a neurotransmitter. Mm -hmm. So neurotransmitters are the molecules that allow neurons to communicate. And um, um, I developed an assay, a biochemical assay, to study the action of uh, this neurotransmitter called noradrenaline. Mm -hmm. It's the adrenaline of the brain. Mm -hmm. And um, I, again, I took a, an angle that was uh, not necessarily the most logical one immediately. Uh, I reasoned that adrenaline in the periphery is the uh, hormone that mobilizes energy uh, to face stress. Uh, and in particular, energy in the body is stored uh, as glycogen, mm. which is the storage form of glucose in liver and muscle. So I said, adrenaline, noradrenaline, they are very similar. Uh, probably noradrenaline uh, does also this in the brain. Maybe it mobilizes energy stores. Mm. And um, I did the experiments, and indeed, I found that noradrenaline was mobilizing glycogen. Mm. And... Um, Little I knew before getting into these, uh, uh, these experiments that, one, there is very little glycogen in the brain, much less than in muscle and, and liver, mm -hmm. and two, that it's comp only and exclusively localized in non-neuronal cells, in glial cells. Mm -hmm. So uh, that, uh, I will get back to this in a moment, but mm -hmm. you have to realize that uh, the brain is made not only of neurons. We have about 100 billion neurons in our human brain. Mm. Uh, and yet, depending on the areas of the brain, we have at least one, as many, and in most cases, even one and a half to two 
times more glial cells than neurons. So these glial cells were discovered in the 19th century by a German uh, pathologist called Virchow, and he called them glia, glia for glue, essentially. Mm -hmm. He thought that this was some sort of connective tissue that was keeping neurons together, mm -hmm. kind of an in inert type cell type, not, not very interesting. Mm. And it remained like this uh, until essentially um, not only my work, but the work of people in the uh, late 70s, early 80s, when it, was be it began to uh, be realized that these cells are much more than glue. And my finding that a neurotransmitter, so a, a molecule released by a neuron, mm -hmm. was exerting a metabolic effect on, by definition, non-neurons, because mm -hmm. glycogen is only in glial cells, actually was, I, I think it's acknowledged, the first demonstration that there was a dialogue between neurons and these non-neuronal cells, and mm -hmm. these non-neuronal cells were not an inert material, mm -hmm. but they were actually responding to neuronal signal. Mm -hmm. And this, the specific case uh, were uh, responding to provide a metabolic response to support, to provide additional energy. Mm -hmm. So that started my uh, quest to understand uh, neuron glia interactions, mm -hmm. in particular in terms of their uh, metabolic uh, context. And um, then I, I moved on for 30 years uh, exploring further this new type of communication within the brain. Mm -hmm. um, for the time being, it has not um, uh, in any ways gotten me closer to studying the mind, I have to admit, <laughs> <laughs> which was my initial quest. Mm -hmm. But uh, it has produced, I think, a lot of, uh, I guess, interesting work and certainly interesting yeah. for me and, 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 and discovering uh, many um, uh, modalities through which neurons and non-neuronal cells communicate. Mm -hmm. And it is now clear and it's not only my work now, it's become a quite uh, important uh, segment of neuroscience, mm -hmm. um, um, that, that there are many forms of uh, dialogue between neurons and glial cells, and that this dialogue is absolutely essential for brain function and brain health. Right. You, you talk a lot about, um, in various lectures that you've given, about the need to uh, go offline. The, the the brains need to go offline. Can you talk a little bit about the mechanisms or, or so some of the ways of, of these different neuron glia interactions that maybe you've you've found something uh, about that in particular? Um, actually, um, there is a connection. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, it's not as straightforward uh, as uh, as uh, at least as far as we know now. But mm -hmm. um, <coughs> what you refer to. Uh, this the brain being offline also uh, it's it's actually um, uh, there are circuits within the brain uh, mm -hmm. that uh, are defined as being the default mode network that uh, paradoxically are more active when we do nothing mm -hmm. so when when I'm speaking when I'm moving my hands there are specific areas of the brain the modality specific mm -hmm. for speech for motor control areas that are more active than uh, the other uh, parts. Mm -hmm. And uh, this has been visualized uh, by functional brain imaging. Mm -hmm. uh, there are various techniques. One is um, kind of barbaric word, positron emission tomography, or PET, uh, which is essentially a technique by which you in inject uh, a um, very um, minutely radioactive uh, molecule mm -hmm. and then measure where it goes in the brain with appropriate uh, apparatus. But what these uh, techniques, PET, positive emission tomography, or the possibly more popular one, functional magnetic resonance imaging, mm -hmm. fMRI, mm -hmm. they actually do not detect uh, directly neuronal activity. They actually detect the consumption of energy that is associated with um, uh, neuronal activity. Mm -hmm. For example, PET detects glucose utilization, oxygen consumption, or blood flow that is uh, coincident 
with neuronal activity. It's like a muscle. When the muscle moves, it uses energy, it uses more glucose, the blood flow increases. It's the same in the brain, but with a very high specific space, spatial and temporal precision. In other words, there is a basal activity in terms of energy consumption of the brain, but mm -hmm. then the areas that are slightly more active will consume more energy, and that you can detect with PET or fMRI. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> this interaction, this metabolic interaction that we discovered between neurons and glial cells mm -hmm. is actually at the basis of uh, these techniques because what you detect is a metabolic uh, signal uh, that hopefully, and we know it is the case, is related to uh, neuronal activity. Now, it, uh, so first of all, this uh, default mode network, seeing which areas are more active at at which time of behavior mm -hmm. uh, depend on these functional brain imaging techniques. Mm -hmm. uh, as I said, there are these some areas that are more active when we do nothing. Right. Uh, so, and immediately as we engage in a modality, let's say start speaking, these areas become less active and the area uh, that is engaged, for example, in speech becomes more active. Mm -hmm. So it's been a real, um, so first of all, this can be detected mm -hmm. thanks to functional brain imaging, mm -hmm. and this uh, uh, is related directly to what I have studied, which is neuron glia, metabolic coupling, because it's this metabolic coupling that produces the uh, signals for functional brain imaging. Right. Now, interestingly enough, it turns out that this came only later, thanks to work, for example, of uh, a very distinguished uh, scientist at uh, Washington University, uh, Dr. Marcus Rakel. Mm -hmm. It turns out that uh, the default mode areas, the areas where this higher activity when we do nothing, uh, when the brain is offline, if you wish, mm -hmm. um, um, is active, have also a metabolic profile that is slightly different and which is from the rest of the brain and which is also related to a particular form of neuron glia metabolic coupling. So um, that's the connection between my work and this notion of uh, uh, brain offline. So the connection is through uh, the mechanism that produces the signals for functional brain imaging and two, it turns out that this default mode has a particular metabolic profile, which is really uh, one of the main forms of neuron glia metabolic uh, coupling. So, so is, this, yeah. is this basal, uh, these are the, ba the basal functions essentially? And, I, and I'm wondering if this leads us to plasticity, uh, because isn't uh, yeah. that downtime, isn't that where some of this stuff, uh, the house cleaning So that's the, the function of the default mode network mm -hmm. uh, is still open for debate. I mm -hmm. mean, um, one view is indeed that we have, we have to be online and mm -hmm. uh, process immediately online information, and then somehow we need to uh, integrate and uh, store this mm -hmm. information, and that the default mode network can contribute to this uh, storage of uh, information. Mm -hmm. um, there are also views that this is a way uh, uh, related to uh, self-consciousness and self-awareness. Mm -hmm. So the actual function is debated. But what is uh, clear, it's, it's quite interesting, and that's where the connection with plasticity comes. Um, as I mentioned a moment ago, uh, this, uh, this default mode, uh, this offline uh, uh, brain uh, activity, um, uh, has a partic is characterized, these circuits are characterized with a particular metabolic profile, uh, which is called aerobic glycolysis. So what is aerobic glycolysis? Glycolysis is uh, the production, the consumption of glucose, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, in certain cases, uh, um, when there is a low oxygen uh, tension for anoxic condition, stroke, mm -hmm. for example, uh, may lead to the production of, of lactate. So this is called anaerobic glycolysis, and this is pathological. But it turns out that lactate, uh, which is a byproduct of glucose, can also be formed in the presence of oxygen in, under physiological conditions, or in certain cases pathological ones, but different from anoxia. Mm. And this is the case, for example, for 
tumors. Tumor of tissues, they use a lot of glucose and they produce a lot of lactate and they, so they function under aerobic glycolysis. This is called also the Warburg effect, it's typical of cancer cells. Mm -hmm. What we found is that glial cells and the particular type that we have studied called the astrocytes mm -hmm. also function uh, in terms of aerobic glycolysis. So what they do, they receive a signal from neurons when they're active, they import glucose from the blood because they have appropriate processes around the blood vessels. And then this glucose, they transform it to lactate. Mm. Uh, I have to tell you that when we proposed this about 20 years ago, it was not an easy uh, ride. <laughs> it was very controversial because for almost everybody, lactate was a toxic substance, right. either related to anoxia mm -hmm. uh, or ex excess uh, muscle activity, uh, uh, lactic acid the accumulation, pain, pain lactic burn, yeah. or uh, at best, quote unquote, cancer. Mm -hmm. So it was certainly not something uh, that you would think would be useful. Turns out that um, uh, this uh, lactate mm -hmm. has uh, several advantages. First of all, energetically, it's somehow a pre-digested form of glucose. It can be immediately used by neurons. So when neurons send a message to astrocytes, they import glucose and they produce lactate. Neurons can immediately use lactate. Mm -hmm. To use glucose, you have to invest some energy, you have to process it. So somehow, if you wish, astrocytes pre-digest glucose and produce lactate for immediate use of neurons when they need it and where they need it. Mm. But uh, even more uh, interestingly, we found uh, over the last five, six years that this lactate is not only a form of energy, but it is also a signal. And it is a signal for plasticity. So when uh, uh, neurons uh, import lactate, uh, a series of mechanisms that we have characterized now are turned on and mm -hmm. they uh, will induce the um, expression of certain genes that are important for plasticity. So what, just a parenthesis, what is neuronal plasticity? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, <coughs> neurons connect uh, between each other through synapses. Mm -hmm. uh, when a circuit is uh, engaged intensely, like it is when we learn uh, something, mm -hmm. well, uh, there are um, changes that occur at synapses which are induced by expression of new genes, which, for example, duplicate the connection uh, at that level. So instead of uh, a couple of receiving sides on the neurons from another neurons, you have two or three or four. So these are called the dendritic spines. So essentially, the end result of all this process is that the synapse is much more efficient. Mm. It's a facilitated synapse. So facilitated synapses are at the basis of learning and memory. Turns out that lactate actually uh, starts or uh, triggers an, uh, s uh, processes that facilitate this plasticity mm -hmm. and so result in facilitated synapses. And indeed we showed that if we block the transport of lactate from astrocytes to neurons, we block memory consolidation. So uh, <coughs> the connection with plasticity and the role of uh, astrocytes and mm -hmm. this gli neuron glia metabolic coupling is mediated by this unexpected molecule, mm -hmm. uh, lactate, which uh, is involved uh, with plasticity. And so uh, it has now been shown that uh, when uh, a, a, a brain regions are involved in a given learning paradigm, they resort to this metabolic profile aerobic glycolysis, which somehow supports, sustains plasticity. Yeah. So uh, to go back to your initial question, neuron glia metabolic coupling results in uh, uh, the production of lactate, which can be an energy source, but also a signal for plasticity. Yeah. And this is based on this aerobic glycolysis profile, which by the way, is the metabolic profile of the default mode. So you've talked about before about the way the brain almost has its foot on, on the brake and the gas in mm -hmm. a way. And is this something that's broken for people, um, for instance, who are suffering from Alzheimer's or, or other brain conditions? So um, the, the idea uh, indeed, I mean, this mm -hmm. balance between inhibition and excitation is extremely uh, 
uh, important, mm -hmm. and it's uh, there is more and more evidence. This is worked by many groups mm -hmm. that this in inhibitory excitatory balance is important for plasticity and for learning and memory. Mm -hmm. uh, from a metabolic point of view, the the part that I study, uh, one can very simply realize that it is easier if you need to uh, immediately mobilize uh, a process, uh, let's say energy, it is easier to have uh, the accelerator on and then uh, inhib uh, an inhibition. It's like in a car, mm -hmm. you would uh, press the accelerator and press the brake at the same time and when you need to start, you just remove the um, brake mm -hmm. and then you can immediately start and that's much more efficient than having to be idling and then uh, only moving the accelerator, it will take much more time to get uh, to a certain uh, performance. So right. the brain metabolically seems to work like this in a, also in a, uh, with a permanent accelerator and then a brake that, uh, that is removed and allows activation mm -hmm. from a metabolic point of view. Um, so that's um, uh, the, yeah, well, the connection. It, it made me wonder. So, so it, it essentially, then it's it's a bit harder. It takes longer for it to consume pure uh, the glucose as opposed to the lactate mediated uh, formula, whatever that exactly. ends up yeah, being. The formula. I like the formula. <laughs> the idea of a formula. Very good. Um, so. Uh, you recently were uh, at EPFL uh, in October. There was a, a conference uh, held in your honor, and uh, so I just wanted to touch a little bit about on that. Um, how did uh, how did that come about, and and uh, and give us a rundown on, on what that involved? Well, so th this uh, this workshop was organized by, by the Brain Mind Institute uh, yeah. at uh, EPFL. Uh, of which I was director for uh, about 10 years before coming to KAUST. Mm. And um, the idea was to somehow, let's say, celebrate um, 30 years of work uh, in the field of uh, neuron glia metabolic coupling. And so the, the day was organized um, uh, with different uh, uh, moments. The mm. first one was let's say a purely scientific one with some colleagues from uh, different parts of the world who came uh, to uh, present their work uh, as it related to, to my work. They had been either inspired by my work or they extended uh, different aspects of, of, of my work. Yeah. Uh, then a second phase was uh, um, a number of my former students who have now uh, uh, faculty positions in different parts of the world, in different universities, they, they said very briefly uh, in 10, 15 minutes, because there were 11 of them, <laughs> uh, you know, how it was to work with me. That was a bit personal and, and, and very, very uh, emotional almost. I really en enjoyed it very much. And then we had a brief panel on with some experts, uh, I mean senior scientists, what the f where is neuroscience going? What's the next uh, uh, next uh, perspectives, in particular in terms of developing therapies for brain mm. diseases, because of course um, uh, this is something that uh, neuroscience needs to produce at some point. Mm. Uh, there is a lot of basic neuroscience, very successful, I would say, over the last 30 years, but mm. uh, the reality also is that major uh, therapeutic developments are quite scarce for the time being. I said we have no treatment for neurodegenerative diseases such mm -hmm. as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease, uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, Huntington's disease. We have some treatments uh, for epilepsy, but there are still uh, unmet needs. Mm -hmm. um, uh, for psychiatric disorders, there are uh, treatments, but they're still uh, not, first of all, not uh, eff effective in, in, in a large portion of the patients, mm -hmm. and also they have major side effects. So there is a huge field for development uh, yeah. in, in, in neuroscience. And so this panel was addressing some ideas about uh, how to go mm. further. And then uh, I gave what is called the honorary lecture, so I reviewed <laughs> my <laughs> My, my scientific career and in particular focusing on my um, my work on neuron glia metabolic coupling. Yeah. Um, what is it like to have people standing on your shoulders now? <laughs> <laughs> that's, yeah, that's... Uh, 
Well, it's humbling, you know. Right. You see that there is so much still to understand. Yeah. And and um, and you were talking about the you know future uh, potential therapies and things. Are there are there any things in particular that you're very excited about in uh, in that realm? Yes, I mean we uh, this group uh, addressed um, uh, different um, um, areas. One was. Uh, an area that actually <laughs> is probably the one that is providing the most advances, and mm -hmm. that is um, neurotechnology. How, uh, for example, uh, mm -hmm. brain stimulation of certain areas has had beneficial effects, not necessarily curative effects, but uh, at least improving the quality of life in Parkinson's disease. Mm -hmm. uh, in particular, uh, a colleague and friend of mine, uh, Dr. Alim Benabid, uh, from Grenoble, he has uh, developed uh, deep brain stimulation for the management of uh, uh, movement disorders. Mm -hmm. uh, it was actually, he came at uh, one of the web here, I invited him to give a talk. Very striking uh, advances, I mean he has improved mm -hmm. the quality of life of uh, over 100,000 people thanks to these techniques. Wow. The, the issue is that we don't know how it works, he himself doesn't really know, but stimulating um, very specific brain areas mm -hmm. um, at a certain frequency, uh, which you can do permanently, like you would have a pacemaker for the heart. You have something similar uh, for this very specific brain area. You can improve, uh, essentially stop tremor, for example, or mm -hmm. people who have other kinds of movement disorders, they, they can have essentially a normal life. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so I think, uh, and this is being tested also in some psychiatric disorders. There have been um, for example, obsessive compulsive disorders mm. um, have been managed, extreme cases have been managed with this technique. So uh, one could can th see other application of this neurotechnological uh, mm. approach, even brain machine uh, interface uh, for neuroprosthetics. So that, that's a whole field where neuroengineering uh, can bring possibly short term, short medium term, that's probably there it would be the, the major uh, advances. And then, uh, of course, new uh, targets for the com more conventional, quote unquote, uh, drug discovery. Mm -hmm. and, and that's, I think, where uh, our work uh, comes into play because, after all, um, industry has targeted for the last 30 years neurons as uh, target for neurodegenerative diseases, for epilepsy, for all the diseases I mentioned, mm -hmm. the target has been neurons. And one has to admit uh, that the success has been extremely limited. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, most major drug companies have uh, uh, retired, have, uh, have abandoned uh, neuroscience. They, they focus on cancer, infectious diseases, cardiovascular, mm -hmm. because uh, large investments that have not led to uh, much re results. Mm -hmm. So my claim is that, well, let's target the other half of the brain. Mm -hmm. Let's target glial cells, develop uh, drugs that uh, target uh, glia-based processes mm. to um, cure neurons. Yeah. And um, uh, that's something that uh, some, uh, uh, we're working on because, and we and, and others, n not many yet. I mean, I still mm -hmm. am, am amazed by the fact that uh, <coughs> half of the brain is, is studied now, much more than 30 years ago when I studied, I can really tell you it was really a curiosity to study these glial cells. Now, uh, the, now th there are many, many groups uh, involved in this research, but even then, uh, it's, it's a small portion. Uh, it's probably, in terms of papers, uh, uh, more or less, there are 10 to 20 times less mm -hmm. papers that deal with glial cells than neurons still. It, it, it makes me wonder, um, c can you paint a, 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 a picture for us of what the brain was thought to be and how it worked uh, when you got into the field? Well, essentially, uh, the brain was um, viewed as a, as a wiring uh, diagram um, where um, uh, small processors, mm -hmm. the neurons, would uh, transmit information, mostly in a binary way, plus or minus. Uh, and, um, and and that was uh, was it right. uh, essentially excitation inhibition more excitation more inhibition some sort of integration maybe when actually um, uh, uh, neurotransmitters were discovered mm -hmm. that were neither excitatory nor inhibitory uh, 
um, the idea was, okay, they maybe are modulatory. They may they modulate excitation or inhibition, but still this uh, as uh, produced uh, limited understanding, we have to admit, uh, uh, about the brain. Yeah. I mean, what has mm, produced a significant and very interesting understanding is functional brain imaging. Mm -hmm. We now have much better uh, notion of, of which areas are engaged uh, in which uh, process, but also how these areas, the interplay between the different areas. So we have a, a macro uh, view which is much better and much more connected with behavior. Yeah. So that, that's important, of course. We have uh, much more uh, study in terms of uh, genomics and uh, gen, uh, um, uh, gene regulation. I mean, when I started, uh, DNA, one didn't even think about DNA and RNA in the brain. Um, they were there, neurons were there once and forever, and uh, there was not much interest in, in studying gene expression. So mm -hmm. uh, there has been obviously uh, an explosion in the study of gene expression in the brain. Uh, in particular in relationship to plasticity, and we now know that there is really changes in genomic uh, gene expression program, mm -hmm. programs during learning and memory, but also during certain uh, diseases. So that's also another advance. And then, uh, indeed, the, uh, there has been an emergence of <laughs> that these neurons, these, uh, these wires are not just suspended in uh, or kept together by this glue, but that mm -hmm. this glue is very important uh, for modulating uh, and contributing quite uh, remarkably to uh, uh, neuronal signals. And in fact, um, I'm just finished uh, writing. It will be published in uh, uh, February. Uh, it's in French uh, with a, um, a very prominent neurologist uh, in Paris, Yves Agide, who was the head uh, was the chair of neurology at uh, La Pitié Salpêtrière, which is the very uh, tr uh, very well known uh, neurology center where Charcot was professor in the 1800s. So it's one of the temples of neurology. So he was head mm -hmm. of of that. So very neuro uh, neuronal um, um, oriented person, and then um, he realized. Uh, that uh, actually uh, probably glia is involved in many disorders. So mm. uh, he contacted me and we decided to write this book about uh, glial uh, cells. Mm. Uh, it will be published by um, Odile Jacob. It's a publishing house in Paris that that is for the, the, the general and educated public, mm. a very successful uh, publishing house. And um, so it will be called uh, the L'homme glial, the, the glial man, <laughs> human, the glial human, uh, and it is about the other half of the brain. So uh, there is still need to um, get this other half of the brain better known uh, by the general public, uh -huh. um, but also by our colleagues, because there is, even though there is much more activity yeah. in this field over the, and it's really increasing year after year. Yeah. I would say over the last even 10 years, there has been a really much, much increased activity. But still, still, uh, it remains uh, a field uh, that, um, well, that is, I wouldn't say marginal, but it's certainly not mainstream yet. In fact, um, uh, Marcus Rakel, my, my colleague from Washington University, he has a nice quote. He says, when you come with something uh, new, a new idea, a new concept, people say it's wrong. The next step, uh, yeah, well, it may be true, but is it really important? Who cares? And then the third level, we always knew. And I think <laughs> that with glial research, we are between two and three. <laughs> Very good. Um, how has having a brain yourself uh, directed your research, uh, your interest in, in your own brain uh, affected the way that you, you think about these things? Well, it, uh, I have, uh, I would say, two levels, uh, like, uh, like essentially anybody who's uh, working in, or most people who are working in the neuroscience field. Uh, I do my day job is to understand how neurons and glia communicate. Mm -hmm. uh, I really am very focused on, on the mechanics or the molecular mechanism or yeah. uh, experimental research. And then I, I have um, a more speculative and theoretical <laughs> uh, dimension, which I uh, am very keen about and I think, think a lot about. 
and uh, which is try to go back to my initial interest, the mind, to understand uh, the mind, the, the biological basis of, of the mind. Mm -hmm. And uh, there it's, it's theoretical <laughs> for the time being. I still think a lot about it, but uh, I haven't come up with an experiment <laughs> that, <laughs> that solved, solved the question. Very good. Well, thank you so much for speaking with us today. And thank you to all of us, for, for, all, for all of you for joining us, uh, particularly on Facebook. Um, you can go to discovery.caus.edu.sa to read uh, work uh, from Pierre Magistretti and, and many of other, other uh, professors. And uh, again, thank you for joining us, and that's all for now.